All right. OK, so uh, I'm going to introduce Joellen. Uh, I'm very excited to introduce my faculty colleague, Dr. Joellen Russell. And uh, Joellen is the Thomas R. Brown Distinguished Chair of Integrative Science. And outside uh, geoscience, she also holds appointments at planetary science, hydrology and atmospheric science, as well as mathematics. Um, so let me just start off by saying that Joellen and her lab group are kind of a powerhouse of research when it comes to the fields of earth system modeling, um, ocean biogeochemistry, carbon cycling, and climate change past, present, and future as well. And Joellen's work has really significantly advanced our understanding of ocean circulation, air-sea interactions, uh, particularly in the Southern Ocean, and as a result has really clarified uh, implications for the relationship between uh, changes in the Southern Ocean and the Antarctic ice sheet for both paleoclimate and future climate change. And I will say that Joellen's research interests not only probe deep into the depth of the oceans, uh, pun intended, but they're also far reaching and her publication portfolio is uh, really extensively broad and very impressive. Uh, just to give you a, a couple examples, Joellen has co-authored and authored papers on a diverse array of topics, including from the atmospheric dynamics of Titan, the moon of Saturn, to more recently looking at the oceanic tracing of uh, radioactive elements due to the Fukushima nuclear plant accident. Uh, and this is just to name a few. On the note of publications, Joellen's got about uh, 50 or so papers, uh, very impressive. And just in the last two years, I'm not gonna go into them in detail, but just in the last two years, has authored three papers in Nature. Um, and she served as an advisor and mentor to several students who have gone on to become very successful in both industry as well as academia. Uh, I first met Joellen at UTIG. She gave a talk at uh, the Institute for Geophysics uh, in Texas about six years ago, I wanna say. Is that, does that sound right, Joellen? Um, and I was still a, a fledgling uh, student at the time, but Joellen, I remember we had a very nice conversation about some of the uh, paleoceanography that I was doing. And uh, I got some very valuable insights from talking with Joellen. Uh, and, and it was uh, very nice to see that type of broad insights into vast ocean uh, research that we were frankly to be, uh, we were lacking at the time at, in Texas. So it was very nice to uh, get that insight from Joellen. Um, in terms of her own trajectory, Joellen received her undergrad at Harvard and then went on to do her PhD at uh, the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. She was then a postdoc at the University of Washington for a little while, and then uh, was a research scientist at Princeton uh, before uh, we got her. And so she joined the University of Arizona Department of Geoscience, I believe in 2006, uh, and she became a full professor last year. Uh, you know, last but not least, you know, Joellen's involved in several uh, committees and uh, other academic activities all across the world, but also here at the University of Arizona. And perhaps most notably, uh, she's the lead of the modeling component of uh, SOCOM, which is the Southern Ocean Carbon and Climate Observations and Modeling Project. And a couple of weeks ago, it was announced that NSF is funding $53 million uh, to fund uh, biogeochemical floats. And if I'm not mistaken, this is gonna be uh, uh, somewhat of a focus in your talk, Joellen. Um, today. And uh, without further ado, take it away, Joellen. Thank you very much, Cal. You're very kind. Uh, it's been a lot of fun building oceans out here in the desert. And the way we do that is with uh, robot floats, supercomputers, and satellites. Well, and plane trips uh, uh, when, when before COVID. So the ocean plays an enormous role in the climate of our blue planet. It's 72% ocean. That's what any alien driving by in their, in their spaceship would notice first is this amazing blueness of our planet, which is unique as far as we know. Um, I'm sure there will be eventually, but uh, uh, this is uh, the only planet that we've actually discovered that is liquid water over the vast majority of its surface. And it has these enormous implications for what happens next, and not just over the whole planet, but here in Arizona, here in our, our beloved desert, it matters. And I'm gonna talk a lot today about how and why the ocean matters to climate. So uh, this is what you're looking at here is FB3. This is not satellite data. This is simulation. This is math and supercomputers. 
And it's the three kilometer simulation of the global atmosphere and ocean um, performed by the Geophysical Fluid Dynamic Laboratory's latest and greatest, which has now been transferred to the weather service. So if you wanted to know why it was so cold yesterday or whether it was gonna be cold in a week, uh, answer is no, it's gonna hit 90 again. <laughs> uh, thank, you can thank an oceanographer because the new model is uh, uh, basically derivative FE1, which is the one that I'm a co-author on uh, from the SJ Lin's amazing atmosphere. This couple model has now been transferred to the weather service and has been pressed into service as our new weather model for the National Weather Service. It's amazing. Uh, it is quite, quite amazing. And believe me, I did not anticipate that this convergence of weather and climate modeling would happen so fast. It basically came much quicker than I anticipated. They had a bake-off about two and a half years ago in April uh, between the old GFS model and the new FE3 and FE3 won. And they have now, and the weather service at NOAA has now implemented this as the weather model for the world and for the United States. Uh, so this is a big deal. What's the difference between a climate model and a weather model? The primary difference is that a climate model has an ocean. And the reason that we really have to pay attention to our ocean these days, why it's become more and more and more critical to our weather forecast, as well as our climate information, is because global warming is really ocean warming. When we look at IRBI, which sits out at the edge of the atmosphere, uh, Earth's Radiation Budget Experiment, which is a series of satellites that sit out to the edge of the atmosphere and looks out at the sun and in at the Earth. And what IRBI tells us is about the same amount of radiation comes in every year, but every year, less comes out. I know that seems impossible and crazy, and yet that is what global warming is. But what you don't notice is that the atmosphere warms every single year. It warms most years, but not every single year. We see big peaks in El Nino years when the ocean gives back a little bit of the heat it's taking up. Now on this plot, you can basically see that oh, since 1970 through 2013, this is an IPCC plot, you're looking at 93% uh, of the, that excess that didn't go back out has been accumulating in the ocean, 93%. And only about 3% has accumulated in the atmosphere. That's this tiny little pink line down here at the bottom. So I uh, give climate talks all over the world and have never been heckled. And the reason is, what are they gonna say to me? <laughs> I'm not talking about that little 3%, although it's so critical to us, I'm talking about the 93%. And it's really important. So I wanna give one, one, I know this is texty wordy, but I wanna show you what the difference is between transient climate response, which is what you and I and our children and our grandchildren and our great grandchildren are all going to be experiencing, which is the transient climate response. And it warms less, it is less sensitive than equilibrium climate sensitivity, which is about double. And the reason is because on the transient, on this big ramp up in CO2 in the atmosphere, it's the ocean stirring that matters. How much of, uh, how much of the, the warming is being accommodated by the ocean, how quickly on the transient. So I'm not going to be talking about our geological colleagues, long time scales, 3000 years plus equilibrium climate sensitivity. I'm gonna be talking about the now and the next hundred years or the next 200 years. This is the transient. This is where you and I will be living together for, and, and all of our kids and grandkids. This, this is what matters to us right now. Okay, so big questions I'm gonna try and answer in this talk. Wither the winds. In the 2001 uh, IPCC assessment, the, the upshot of our modeling and our literature survey said that the community believed that eventually the westerlies would decrease that there actually be weakened westerlies because the equator to pole temperature gradient at the surface uh, especially sea surface temperatures, because of polar amplification, the winds would decrease. That is exactly not what has happened. It's 180 degrees from that. In fact, the winds are cranking. And I'm gonna show all kinds of evidence about how they're cranking. And, uh, and the reason is those older models didn't have stratospheres. So the only temperature gradient that mattered was the one along the surface. But if you actually looked at the one from below to above, uh, from the troposphere to the stratosphere. And that's kind of what we're looking here in the limb of the planet here on the background of the slide is that the stratosphere has been cooling because less is getting out, right? 
So in fact, we've got a bigger temperature gradient. And when we have a bigger temperature gradient, we're likely to have bigger winds by the thermal wind equation at a basic. So whether the winds and how will these wind changes affect transient climate response? How much more predictability might reside in the ocean for helping us respond to these changes, both on short and longer time scales? And then what does that mean? How will, what will our grandchildren get to keep of our biosphere one of our planet's ecosystems who are trying to scramble and adjust to these major changes? So I just wanna start, here's the global trend in altimeter wind speed over the period 1985 to 2018. You'll notice that there is nowhere, okay, there are a few tiny blue dots. If you look carefully, there are a few tiny blue dots where the winds might've decreased, but generally it's increasing everywhere. And this is uh, statistically significant. It came out, it's a Young and Ribble paper that came out in 2019 in science. Um, and I just wanna give you an idea. The Southern Ocean is the windiest place in the world, full stop. Outside of a hurricane or a tornado, you're looking at the strongest winds in the world, they're massive and they go forever. There is unlimited fetch, there is unlimited, uh, 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 and no, very, very few in the way of speed bumps, like uh, the tiny bit of the Andes that stick down here in the archipelago. So massive uh, uh, cyclones roaring around the Southern Ocean. This is just for July, August, September in 2019. So you get an idea. So why is the Southern Ocean so important? Not only is it the windiest place in the world, it's also the window in the, to the deep ocean. This is the place where the only water that upwells from deeper than 800 meters in the global ocean anywhere upwells around Antarctica. There are some coastal upwelling that goes from about 600 meters, tropical equatorial from about 200 meters, coastal 100 meters, but this, this ocean upwells from below 2000 to 3000 meters, not not even kidding. It's a completely or different order of magnitude. Um, and the reason is that uh, is the divergence set up by those massive winds roaring around Antarctica, which basically by Ekman transport, push the water away in all directions. And since you can't have a hole in the ocean, up, up, up the water comes. The stronger, it's simple F equals MA, force equals mass times acceleration. The stronger you push, the more water you move, the deeper you have to upwell from. It's really quite, quite, I, I think it's wonderful. So I've been obsessed with this since I was, I don't know, 19, pretty sure. Okay, so it accounts for 67 to 98% of the excess heat that's transferred from the atmosphere into the ocean. So all of that ocean warming, that 93% of the energy balance of the total planet, of that 93%, 67 to 98% goes in around Antarctica. Why do we rob banks? Because that's where the money is. Why do we study the Southern Ocean? Because that's where the heat is. It's also where the carbon is. One out of eight molecules of carbon that comes out of anybody's tailpipe anywhere in the world goes in around Antarctica, one out of eight. One out of four goes into the ocean somewhere, but one out of eight goes in around Antarctica. It's also responsible for three quarters, 75% of the nutrients that are upwelled into the thermocline anywhere in the world to produce the amazing abundance of phytoplankton and food webs worldwide that came, that was upwelled in the Southern Ocean. So we are studying uh, uh, harder and faster all the time, trying to do better prediction science. We need to know what's going to happen next with this extraordinary amount of CO2 that we're putting into the atmosphere. And I love putting this up, partly because I like to put up the picture of Dave Keeling. And this Keeling curve, of course, is carved under the wall of the National Academy of Science. They wouldn't let him in until he was 65 even though he started doing this as a relatively young man in 1958. You can see when these records started at Mauna Loa on the South Pole. But also so that everybody understands, it doesn't matter where you are on earth, everything we emit is well mixed within a year. Up, up, up she goes. And the way we measure it is through this incredible NOAA network, uh, cooperative network of uh, measurements and uh, the backbone of which is run right here out of uh, Boulder, Colorado at, at Ezreal which is pretty amazing. And it's contributing to all of the, the uh, greenhouse gas uh, scattering, which is basically keeping that top of the atmosphere uh, energy imbalance growing every year. So I just wanna point out one local impact, which is that uh, Arizona is number three out of America's 10 fastest warming states. I know we all felt it this summer. That was pretty, pretty grim. We're also, <clears throat> 
Tucson is the third fastest warming city and Phoenix is the fourth. Uh, uh, and if you're wondering what that looks like in uh, cabin fever uh, terms, this is what it looks like in Tucson. We have 17 more days above 105 uh, since 1970. Um, in Yuma, they have 18 more days over 110. Uh, it's big. So this is what a uh, climate model might predict uh, for uh, 2030, which is just in 10 years now, right? You see the big bullseye of more heat over uh, the Southwest, as well as significant drying as our jet moves forward and takes all the water with it. Uh, so these are local impacts, but there are also ocean impacts. We've got marine heat waves that are driving major bleaching events on the Great Barrier Reef and reefs around the world at this point, corals. And I know you've heard from Diane Thompson and her amazing work up at the Biosphere 2 and in the global ocean. So these are uh, direct related to uh, this ocean warming that we're talking about. And uh, we, at one point, were very worried about ocean acidification, uh, but now I'm worried that the corals won't make it to when <laughs> ocean acidification will get more difficult for them. But if I can't interest you in anything impractical, like uh, beauty and uh, diversity and uh, a reef that's been growing for a million years, maybe you're interested in our greatest naval base. Um, after one, and this is not including the freshwater forcing from melting of uh, Greenland and Antarctica that uh, Chris Herrig and Marcus Lufferstrom could tell you all about, uh, but just from steric sea level expansion associated with the warming of the ocean, this same thing we're talking about. So after one and a half degrees warming, we get about all, all the blue areas are underwater, two degrees and four. You can see that this is, if you knew that your greatest naval base would be taken by the enemy sometime 20 years, 40 years, 80 years, uh, how worried would you be? And this is the kind of scales that I wanna talk about. This is from the National Marine Fisheries Service. These are the kinds of time scales for decision-making that the fishery service right now needs to to use. It could be industry operations on days to weeks, monitoring closures on months, annual catch limits, or protected species management on annual timescales, rebuilding plans, protected areas, long-term industry resource capitalization, resiliency, sustainability, as things get longer and longer. Um, and these are, are, are related to hurricanes and tropical storms, the, the marine heat waves, ENSO, PDO, AMO, global warming on the longest time scales. This, the, we need this information. And so prediction science has become more and more important because we need to be able to, to make decisions quickly based on the best possible information about what, our, what it means to make these decisions. So prediction science, what's next? Climate models, robot floats, and satellites. Let me just lay out where we're going with this. What we're doing is building the observing system of the future. We want to know not just what that carbon sink is in the Southern Ocean, what the feedbacks will be onto climate, but also can we use the tools we're building for, for telling what our long-term, you know, and when I say long-term, I mean 100 years. I don't mean millions, I mean transient, just to point it out. So. Uh, different models have uh, better faithfulness to observations. And you can see in the green where our observational uncertainty sits. And you can see that some models get pretty close to that observational uncertainty and some don't. Um, so we, uh, it matters what model you use and how well it's developed. It's not inherent that every model is equally able to plumb all of the predictability out of each individual aspect of the system. And the climate models are, everybody knows this, I'm sure, but computer code that solves the differential equations of air motion thermodynamics to obtain time and space dependent values for temperature, wind speed, moisture, and pressure in the atmosphere and similar quantities in the ocean. Um, our climate modeling used to be just an atmosphere, then an atmosphere in a swamp ocean, then an atmosphere swamp ocean, and you can see how we've come. But even uh, up until very recently, one, we did not include ice sheets or the impacts of ice sheets, and we didn't include upper atmosphere, ozone holes, or the stratosphere. See how recently, or marine ecosystems, see how recently, 2010, 10 years ago, we didn't have the capability of looking at these accelerating, poleward shifting, crazy westerly winds. We didn't have the capability of looking at marine ecosystem impacts and feedbacks. We couldn't do it. We literally didn't have the code or the coupled 
uh, models to do it with. And here's where we are now. So let's 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 look at some of the results. So. A climate model just has the physics. It's just straight up. And notice I don't have any ice over there, just the sea ice, not the land ice. Earth system models actually gives you the interactive CO2, so you can actually see the full coupled feedbacks. Um, ocean ecology, biogeochemistry, dynamic vegetation on land, it's a hoot. But it's expensive. There's a reason that we've been relatively limited to going to higher and higher resolution the way we would like to, or adding layers and layers and layers in the stratosphere as we would like to, or adding more detail and complexity to our biogeochemistry and our vegetation models. Of course, we'd love to do all that, but it's expensive. This is Moore's Law, and I'm just showing you when GFDL bought different computer supercomputing systems. Uh, and I started in, let's see, right about here. <laughs> the Earth simulator and help break this IBM blue gene. <laughs> it's expensive. It takes a while. And uh, we are lucky here at the University of Arizona that we built an incredible supercomputing facility, a high performance computing facility that has shared memory that allows you to run Earth system models. In fact, the University of Arizona is the first university in the world to actually run their own climate model and submit it for uh, CMIP 6. So uh, that's all thanks to Ron Stauffer, who is adjunct here at the university and is absolutely invaluable to my group. I can't imagine what I would do without him. So, and I just want to point out where what the framework is for carbon and the climate. This, the ultimate object, objective for the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC, uh, was stabilizing greenhouse gas concentrations um, that would prevent dangerous human-induced interference with the climate system. Uh, too late, <laughs> sort of a pottery barn. You broke it, you bought it. <laughs> and notice that that is in fact a, a Republican, uh, President H.W. Bush, who took us into this convention. And here is the way that it's progressed uh, from 1990, where the report did not quantify the human contribution to global warming to 2013, 95% chance, extremely likely that uh, humans are responsible for more than half of Earth's temperature increase since 1951. So uh, what would I like to do with the Southern Ocean and uh, carbon science that I'm suggesting? It's science solutions. We have a framework. We have a framework convention. We have a Paris Agreement. I know we're out technically as of, what, two days ago, I think. Uh, but we can get back in. <laughs> uh, and even if we didn't get back in, it is actually the law of the land. The Clean Air Act, the Supreme Court ruled, does in fact require the EPA to regulate carbon dioxide as a pollutant. They ruled, citing only the scientist brief, which is kind of amazing, uh, that was organized right here from the University of Arizona from uh, Kirsten Engel, who's over in the law school and in our state Senate, um, and uh, Scott Zaleska and, uh, uh, and me and uh, others, and uh, it worked. So it is actually the law of the land of the United States. But there are two methods for estimating emissions. Right now, pretty much worldwide, we are using the bottom up which is the national inventories, estimates anthropogenic emissions and removals based on socioeconomic statistics and is self-reported. And the uncertainty has been growing lately. I know you're all shocked to hear, <laughs> but we would like to do it from top down. And uh, so here is the self-reported. Um, the uncertainties are in fact growing, uh, particularly with reports from uh, <clears throat> China on this. This is from the Global Carbon Project. Uh, but the, I just want to point out that the US CO2 emissions decreased by 14% uh, through 2007 and to, from 2007 to 2017. Slight increase in 2018 and then another drop in 2019. So fate of anthropogenic carbon dioxide. If you take our emissions, which are our greenhouse gases and our uh, land use change, and you partition it into the atmosphere, ocean, and into greening on land, uh, essentially, one of the biggest uncertainties is that 72% of the planet, which is ocean. And because we want one out of eight molecules goes in around Antarctica, here's a way to reduce uncertainties is to measure that better uh, and then model it better. The only problem is the Southern Ocean is incredibly bad to work in. I mean, insanely bad. Uh, which means that uh, going to sea is very expensive. It's about $50,000 a day. You get about uh, five profiles every two days, which is about at five profiles per $100,000. So 
Uh, the number of measurements worldwide from uh, in the World Ocean Database shipboard uh, between 1999 and 2015 was only about half a million measurements. And you can see all the white space on this diagram. It is an oceanographer's diagram, so all the continents are grayed out. But uh, uh, there's a lot of white space out there. So robot floats, this is where we've gone to actually fill that in. And you can see the measurements from Argo. Now these are primarily starting in 2004, uh, running through today and are the physical measurements of temperature and salinity. So Southern Ocean Carbon and Climate Observations and Modeling is a collaboration between the University of Arizona, Princeton University, Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, uh, the University of Washington and Scripps. Basically everywhere I've ever worked. <laughs> Not a joke. <laughs> okay, not Harvard. <laughs> but everybody else, <laughs> friends at each of these locations, people I've worked with, it's it's pretty fantastic. Uh, and uh, in addition to the original $21 million that they that the National Science Foundation gave us, they've granted us a further $9 million to extend its work from six to 10 years to allow illumination of the Southern Ocean's role in climate that was not possible with the shorter time scale. It's very exciting. That happened just this year. Um, uh, I am going to try, this is the old array that you used to have to use. Um, I'm gonna skip forward so you can see these new floats that are being deployed. So we used to have to do all these measurements by hand. Now we use micro sensors and that's Becky Beedling who's now graduated and working on her Global Change, NOAA Global Change Fellowship, postdoc fellowship at GFDL. And uh, she deployed some of our floats. Uh, uh, Hannah Zanowski is one of our undergrads who's now an assistant professor at U Wisconsin Madison is actually uh, deployed our first batch off the tip of uh, uh, Africa um, um, on the polar stern, which is pretty amazing. So we, we are at 197 floats so far. We'll have another 200 deployed into the Southern Ocean. Uh, the people I work with, Lynn Talley is the lead for the observations. I'm the lead for the, the modeling. Ken, uh, Ken Johnson at Mumbari is the, he uh, uh, invented our pH sensor and our nitrate sensor. Steve Reiser builds the floats at the University of Washington, an amazing physical oceanographer. And uh, we have calculated from our floats uh, the carbon flux from all this new data that we didn't have before, particularly in the winter when it's not safe to use a ship. And we're assimilating that into a biogeochemical Southern Ocean State Estimate right here at the University of Arizona. That work is led by Matt Masloff, Ariane Verity, but and uh, all the crunch happens here because uh, UCSD, who has a supercomputer center, is apparently really stingy with their time. So too bad for them. We'll, we'll run it here. And this is what it looks like. That's Antarctica in the middle and you're looking at your uh, Pacific Indian uh, and Atlantic sticking out from Antarctica. And this is created from all this new data um, assimilated into uh, the biogeochemical state estimate. It's pretty amazing. So we actually made some calculations right from the get about what we needed to do in order to constrain the global ocean. And I'm getting to that announcement. So this is what we did with just the SOCOM money and some help from our friends. We've got some floats up here from the French, some floats down here from the Australians, a few from the Japanese, but basically American floats and uh, SOCOM primarily. Uh, this is uh, me in the pink scarf here in the middle uh, at Villefranche planning this way back uh, uh, in 2014. And uh, just this last week on October 29th, the NSF approved a $53 million grant to a consortium of ocean institutions here in the US. It's led by Ken who did our, our pH sensor. And I wanna show you how this is supposed to work all together now. Uh, we deploy the floats, just like you saw Becky doing. They make all these profiles. The ship also makes measurements so that we can uh, ground truth with the, old, the, the way we used to do it with the very high precision with all the detail. We beam all this satellite data, all the data, every time the float pops up, beams the data back uh, via, via Iridium satellite uh, to land. And we put it all online with an automatic QC that gets you up in two hours, which is pretty fantastic. Don't worry, I'm gonna get to the science-y stuff. Hold on. This is science, but uh, we couldn't answer some of these big questions without actually new platforms, new sensors, and new ways of con connecting these things. So we're assimilating all of this data that the floats and the ships are getting, and you're about to see a satellite mobi dun, 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 to actually fit this out completely. Hold on. 
And there it goes, mowing the lawn, giving us our wind information to help, help constrain our global ocean. So the three pieces, robot floats, supercomputers, and satellites. And the winds are growing. This is the worry. The winds are not getting weaker, not even a little bit. These are, this is the wave power calculated globally and by ocean basin. And you're down here, you're looking at the black at the global, the Indian, the Pacific and the Atlantic. This red one going up, up, up through 2010. Yeah, that's the Southern Ocean. I know, everybody's like, well, I just don't think the Southern Ocean's cranking up that much. I'm like, I swear, I was there. I know it is. They're like, oh, but look at this. So it's even true that um, decadal variations in wind speed um, that have been reconstructed by ocean atmosphere oscillations. And what you'll see is here's the global. And since 2010, it's cranked up. In North America, 2012, cranking up. Since 2002, roughly in Asia and in Europe down here. But mostly, so most of the world is actually increasing in wind speed, but the Southern Ocean is doing it most. And it's not just that it's doing it most, it's that the gyres are shifting poleward and increasing strength in the ocean too. Um, this is a big deal and is missed by most of our climate models whose winds actually don't tilt much poleward during warming. It's a little bit, they all do it, but it's very small and they start from a position, it's actually equatorward of where they should be even for observations today. So there's one other thing, which is the meltwater from Antarctica. As Antarctica is melting, of course, we I mentioned earlier, none of the scenarios for CMIP actually include meltwater. So as part of SOCOM, I ran this SOMEP, the Southern Ocean Model Inter Comparison Project as a part of FAFMICH, which is a flux anomaly forced model inter comparison project. And so we're basically contributing directly to the IPCC CMIP uh, couple model inter comparison project through this, these experiments. And uh, so we add meltwater, we add winds, uh, meltwater separately, winds separately, and then together to simulate what we think the real Southern Ocean should look like. And we got a very nice paper out, uh, Ben Bronsler, my postdoc, who's now the climate analyst for BP in London. He has a beautiful apartment, apparently. <laughs> making real bank, <laughs> but he's kind of ditched us. <laughs> so uh, doing this great uh, with just the meltwater experiment and the lid that it puts on to the ocean. I'm not actually going to talk about this very much, even though it's really critical for paleo, uh, is to think about the implications of what this means, because normally uh, the ocean's carry heat towards the poles and then release that heat to the atmosphere. When you have this fresh water lid from the melting, it can actually release all that heat to the atmosphere. It actually slows the rate of that so that essentially you start building up the heat on, in the subsurface. Oddly enough, it tends to concentrate right about 600 meters, which is where the great ice sheets have their toes buried in the water uh, on the grounded ice sheet line. So this, this is really bad because it is a positive feedback. The more you melt, the more fresh water you put on the lid, the more heat is retained in the ocean, the warmer it gets right along the edge, driving more subsurface melt. Not good. <laughs> So we did this again with both the wind and the meltwater. And this was the uh, result for our SOMIT paper, which is if you want to simulate both the physical and biogeochemical changes in the ocean associated with the, what we see with these gorgeous new floats doing all their work under the ice, outside of the ice, year round, every 10 days, woo. The only way to see that, the only way to reproduce that in a model is you need to add a poleward intensification of the winds this flux anomaly, and you need to add the fresh water from Antarctica. One by itself does not work. It does not simulate the full thing just to add the fresh water. If you just add the winds, you don't get the same dipole pattern. It's only if you add both that you see the real Southern Ocean and how it's responding. So there, these are the observed physical changes from the floats. These are the observed biogeochemical changes from the floats. And you'll notice they have these big dipoles here in the oxygen, here in the nitrate, here in the DIC. And the pH is actually just lower everywhere, which is terrible. So the inter ocean ventilation changes. Increased age, red, implies reduced ventilation, which is right up uh, along the uh, south of the polar front. But you have increased uh, ventilation offshore, where you have the big wind anomalies. And you only see this combined anomaly of decreased ventilation towards Antarctica, increased ventilation away from Antarctica, if you add both of these anomalies to the climate model. So we're pretty excited about this. Now here, here's another wrinkle. 
we're worried that this increase in the wind that's required and the increase in the freshwater is actually visible today. And why aren't we seeing it? In our ERA, uh, in our ERA-5, in our reanalyses, we're just not seeing a really big trend. Now there is one, but it's relatively weak. And the reason we're really worried about it, particularly with respect to carbon, is you can see that most of the time in the Southern Ocean in the summer, the ocean is taking up carbon. Everywhere that's blue, it's taking up carbon. But in the winter, when the winds are really cranking and we're upwelling from very, very deep, we basically are upwelling carbon enriched water, which even with respect to our atmosphere today is super saturated and degasses to the atmosphere. That was that original paper that uh, Alison Gray wrote documenting that there's way more coming out than we thought, which actually means that the ocean might not be as big a sink as we think. Uh-oh. And it might be changing on climate timescales, which is terrifying. So the percent of area in each wind speed band from Vsauce from our state estimate is here on the left. And if you look in the red, what you're looking is the area fraction of uh, the different wind speed bands. Um, and this is the percentage of the area that's active in, uh, and then this is the flux fraction in PCO2. So you'll see that the distribution of winds is not coincident with the distribution of carbon flux. And there's a reason because it's very nonlinear carbon uh, transfer between um, uh, the ocean and atmosphere at high wind speeds. This is Rick Wannenkopf's work uh, that is so amazing. And he's actually a collaborator on my current project with Zephyr. So I'm very excited about this. So 71% are under uh, of the carbon flux occurs at winds over 10 meters a second. How about them apples? Basically, an enormous amount of the flux into and out of the ocean happens at only at these very high wind speeds around Antarctica. So wither the wind really, really matters. So I'm going to show you why I think we are not capturing these winds properly. Why we don't see the trend because we are undersampling these radical winds and that they're cranking up more and more and we're just not seeing it. So to complete the picture, I don't just need biogeochemical floats worldwide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's already fun. It's old news now, right? <laughs> We need a satellite. We need another scatterometer. We really do. And it has to be deployed exactly right and combined with some amazing data assimilation. So let's see what this looks like. So I'm the PI on a proposal to NASA on Earth Venture mission um, to measure the Southern Ocean storms. And it's called Zephyr. Uh, so this is a team uh, that uh, I'm the PI and the science team lead, Nikki Levandusky from CU Boulder. Very just won the, the young uh, the oceanographers award at EGU. Um, uh, Chuck Fellows is my program manager from here at the University of Arizona. He's uh, um, we this is our second time around with this proposal, and the last one, my colleague and friend uh, David Long from BYU was the PI. We've switched roles now. Now he's the deputy PI, and I'm the PI, and he's because uh, uh, we're going whole hog after the Southern Ocean. Before we were doing coastal regions, which is not quite as much fun in my opinion. And now we're, we're, re, we're resubmitting and we're, we're really excited about this. And uh, uh, I just wanna mention that Marcus is on uh, this proposal with us as is uh, Shubin Jang from uh, Hydrology and Atmospheric Sciences, $190 million, woohoo, you know, go cats. Let's see what we can do. Uh, the AO is supposed to drop in the next week. It's the, uh, so this is what I'm going to show you. Southern Ocean Storm Zephyr, measuring Southern Ocean winds from space to close the carbon budget. If this is an observing system design experiment that we're submitting to GRL. Uh, one, how important are the high winds to the Southern Ocean carbon flux? Two, what do we capture now with our current array of scatterometers? And how would that change if we added just one more? Uh, what would we get if winds were 20% stronger than we think they are now and, with, and if we added an extra scatterometer, how well would we do? So a scatterometer is basically a radar that allows you to basically look at the wave height uh, interference and uh, estimate how hard the winds are blowing. It's uh, uh, This is not new tech. We've had scatterometers for 
30 years now. Uh, but, uh, and the US has led in this. In fact, David Long is associated with all of the American scatterometers. I, I can't tell you what a privilege it is to work with basically the, the father of scatterometry uh, for wind speed here in the US. It's just amazing, I, I can't tell you. And here are the current and historical scatterometer configurations. Uh, that have been uh, deployed before and, or who are, uh, some of these are still operational. Um, so the current satellites are in, uh, uh, are operate, the ones are in blue and then uh, approved or in development, et cetera. So you'll see that we've got high 2 a uh, and uh, uh, ASCAT here. Um, and our scatterometer, the US one is defunct. It died on the space station and we're not replacing it. <clears throat> These are not independent satellites. They are independent satellites, but they're all measuring at the same time in the same, uh, their descending node crossing times are all, you'll notice, within two hours of each other. That means that they're basically measuring at the same time in the same place. So mm, I'm worried about this. I want to run a simulation as uh, an observing system design experiment to check and find out if the fact that they're all on the same track at the same time might be limiting their usefulness in fully sampling those very high winds. So we created an hourly mass for each satellite, 24 mass per day for uh, Zephyr, which is this big, wide, thick one, and the ASCAT one and two that are currently up. And we're sampling B Saucy, which is the Biogeochemical Southern Ocean State Estimate, which was created out of SOCOM and all these great robot floats. And uh, it's pretty fantastic. So uh, this is what we currently do. The time to return is nearly between 12 and 24 hours for most of the Southern Ocean under the current ASCAT uh, configuration. If we add Zephyr, that drops to six hours on average. So because we pick an orthogonal time at least six hours apart, and instead of getting two per day, we get four per day. Woo, this is very exciting. I know. I know it sounds silly because everybody knows what sampling is. Anybody who has a curve and an ice core or something, like, we need to get more samples. There might be a peak there that we might be missing, right? This is not how I scatterometer colleagues think at all. So <laughs> let me show you what happened. So we ran BSASI with data simulation of our current winds from ERA-5 at highest resolution. And then we added a 20% anomaly to that. What if the winds were 20% stronger than we think? This is not perfect. This is not designed to be specifically what will happen in the future. It's just a design experiment. We ran it with all the bells and whistles as perfect as we could get it and then we just added 20 percent to see what happens and it flipped the sign of the carbon flux in the southern ocean from ingassing to outgassing on the left is without it's almost entirely ingassing and on the right you see massive outgassing because of the increased winds now would we be able to see that change in the winds if we just had a scat up okay so here we have the carbon fluxes on the left and the heat fluxes on the right. We've got the zonally integrated carbon flux and you can see the big flip here in the pink line that in the deep winter, which is July for them, instead of it being like the blue line, which is still in, is still in gassing uh, at, at, at the current simulation, if we crank the winds up, it becomes outgassing because it's digging to deeper water with more carbon and it's driving that out faster. So you're getting an enormous carbon flux to the atmosphere. Um, over here, and what we're doing is just the Januaries are to the right and the Julys are to the left. So you can see that the Southern Ocean is either taking a peat if it's in the uh, in the summer and in the winter, it's it's uh, outgassing heat. So these are these are really important, but it doesn't have as big an effect on heat. Now let's let's look at this again. So for the carbon, if this is what we think at one, the actual today, this is what's going on with our carbon. If we measure it with ASCAT, we get about 81% recovery of what we know is happening in the model. So the model tells us exactly what's happening. We sample it using the exact swath that the ASCAT satellites are on. They only recover 81% of the carbon flux because they're missing some of the high winds. With Zephyr, we get 
if we add one satellite. We do this to 1.2 where we've added 20% to the momentum budget and it's now degassing really strongly in the winter and very abruptly and from very deep values. You find that in fact, uh, you don't get even the 81%, you get 71% of with just ASCAT and you get 96% when you add Zephyr. You're undersampling even worse in the winter when you have more coming out at very high wind speeds. So our current satellite configuration could be getting as little as 71% of what we need, what we know the winds would be doing to drive the carbon. At best, they're getting 81% and missing a fifth of the wind that's driving the carbon. So uh, we've submitted this to GRL, which is a lot of fun. We, oh, I just wanted to compare this to the, um, uh, to the heat flux here on the bottom. You actually, for heat, ASCAT gets 86% and Zephyr gets 96%. And for carbon at just the one, the today, the perfect today um, reanalysis, we get, a ASCAT gets 81% and Zephyr gets 96%. So we would like to argue to NASA that they need one more satellite and you might uncover a change in the winds that is extraordinary and critical to the future of the transient and our climate over the next hundred years. Ah, so exciting. <laughs> so we need carbon weather. We need to move from just the long-term carbon climate to what's happening now. Do we have a horse race in reduction of emissions that we could help stimulate by reporting on who's doing what to whom in the atmosphere with that little piece of the earth that's the 28% that's land where all the humans live? So 10 years ago, we didn't have an international political agreement to address the carbon cycle. We didn't have a carbon observing satellite. We didn't have Earth system models that could fully accommodate all this wonderful dynamic vegetation, ocean biogeochemistry, and we didn't have biogeochemically censored floats. We have all the pieces. We just need one more satellite. So hopefully we're going to bring SOS Zephyr home to the University of Arizona. And yeah, that's not a scotch bottle. Those of you who are laughing, that is a float <laughs> in the way. Woohoo. This is uh, the logo that's going to be on all our swag. Woohoo. Uh, so what comes next? Uh, we're going to build out the global array of BGC Argo floats already funded. We're going to uh, build an earth system assimilation for carbon and ecosystems in the ocean that will help us attribute uh, the main uh, carbon emissions to the top 10 economies. We're going to get SOS Zephyr up to calculate that carbon weather and publish the top 10 economies monthly carbon bill. And we're going to do all of that hopefully within the next five to seven years. Yay! So thank you all for coming to my talk. We can do this. Thank you, Joellen. Uh, I have actually not my applause button is not working, so I apologize. So I'm going to applaud <laughs> live right now. So thank you very much, Joellen. And uh, there is plenty of time for questions. So please raise your hand and or uh, type your question in the chat. So Janjin has a question. Janjin, you want to go ahead? Yeah. So Joella, I have a question about the uh, the Wesley's over the Southern Ocean. So you showed that the, uh, the trend show a clear change around 1980. I'm yep. wondering, is that right? Yep. Yeah, is that due to the, uh, the ozone, uh, due to the greenhouse gas or internal variability? Do you expect that trend will continue during the next decade? I do. Um, two things. One, the temperature of the stratosphere is still dropping. While the ozone is recovering somewhat, we think maybe, although this year was very, very bad, uh, I think it's the fourth largest ozone hole on record. Um, even as the um, ozone recovers, the CO2 has gotten so blanketed that there is it's gotten so thick that less is getting out. The stratosphere continues to cool. In fact, did you know that over the tropics, the stratospheric temperature has dropped almost six degrees. I mean, it was only four just a few years ago. And the north, the northern, the Arctic has a stratospheric temperature that's dropped by three degrees, I believe, already. And of course, the southern hemisphere is nine, um, the, the South Pole. So yes, I expect it to continue. I expect because the CO2 is so enormously increased that in fact, um, we always knew 
that uh, that the ozone would would launch us, right? But that eventually the CO two would take over and do the same role as because it does keeps um, heat from escaping towards the stratosphere. So in fact, yeah, um, this was a nice Solomon and Thompson paper that came out. Okay, thank you. We have a question from Tim Swindle. Tim, go ahead. Uh, so we've talked a lot about Zephyr. Uh, the question I was wondering, uh, I hadn't talked, I don't quite understand the business with the time of day because that seems to be the real difference with adding Zephyr is adding a different time of day. But if you're looking yep. at the Southern Ocean, I would have thought that the diurnal cycling would be less uh, at high latitudes than it is elsewhere. It's not the diurnal. It's the, that we have enormous, very high speed winds in these big cyclones. And the problem is that we're only getting one sample per day, basically. All the satellites are basically getting one pass over this uh, 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 twice a day, we get a glimpse of what these, uh, what these are doing. And that is really problematic because in fact, if you subsample a really extreme sine wave, what you end up with is a much smaller sine wave because the likelihood of you getting the timing right where they're moving and they're very large, but the peak winds are right, uh, have a very specific uh, dimension, you're just missing it. We're just under sampling. We need, going from two to four gets us from 80% to 96. I, I know it, it is the dumbest argument I've ever made in my life, but it totally works. <laughs> Anytime they suggest a flux mission anymore, I am going to absolutely look at repeat. How often do they repeat? Because if they are undersampling the most extreme winds, they are undersampling, they are absolutely not able to close that carbon budget or any budget. Next, we have a question from uh, Shubin Zeng. Shubin, go ahead. Hey, Joanne, and terrific talk. Um, you, you know, listening to you about the sampling issue, I, I realized we published your paper a few years ago, not for the Southern Ocean, but for the Arctic. Same situation turns out. So we have this old idea of measuring maximum and minimum temperature, for example. That's valid for Tucson. When you go to Arctic, it's not a relevant, it's a direction of weather systems. Exactly. That's that same situation there. Now my question is, under what scenarios you could increase the wind by 20% in your uh, hypothesis testing? This is, uh, so one, we don't know because no model increases as much as we've seen over the last 30 years, let alone no model, no climate model has actually simulated this trend well in the winds. Two, we're not sure what that trend actually is because we are under sampling and that 80% missing 20% uh, of the total um, is, is big. But second, it's uh, um, the shape here is critical, not just for what you, what the weather prediction component of it, but because carbon has this uh, particular nonlinearity with the deep ocean upwelling, um, it's not just the speed at which you can push it across the interface, it's they're actually changing the shape of the gradients underneath the winds as well, which is the double whammy on the carbon and why we're focusing on closing the carbon budget. I did show the heat. The heat fluxes are improved, but the improvement is nowhere near as critical to closing the budget for the heat as it is for the carbon. Thank you. And I picked 20% because uh, basically as an envelope, what was the extreme end of what we might expect? And it, it isn't realistic. It was in the on the order of, but it was less than actually we have imposed in the past in SOMET. Okay. Thank you. Joellen, there's a question in the chat from Warren Beck. Warren says, uh, increased Antarctic ice shelf melt fluxes leads to increased sea ice extent. What is the impact of enhanced sea ice on wind velocity over the Southern Ocean from these increased sea ice? This is a really interesting question. You would think that it would speed up, but Southern Ocean ice, sea ice is, uh, is annual, right? We only get it for a particular, in the winter and it only, it extends out and then retreats. 
all the way to the coast. There's very little sea ice outside in the summer, outside the Ross Sea or the Weddell Sea. So in fact, the increased winds, which are not just winter phenomenon, they're actually increased year round, um, are, uh, but, but particularly bad in the winter. Um, you have to take that with kind of a grain of salt. And then there's the other part, which is because it's only one year ice, right? And it's not even a year, it's like a few months. Um, it's slushy. A lot of the edges, and it's not clear how hard and fast any of this ice is. So the short answer is, I don't know if the roughness makes a difference. Uh, longer answer is, uh, I'm not sure how important it is. And the extent differences here are pretty small. This isn't like a 20% increase. It's like a didn't melt back the way we expected it to kind of increase. Uh, we, we have a couple more minutes left. Joellen, I'm gonna ask you a quick question. Um, can you talk about how this undersampling uh, potentially feeds back onto the potential observation of the gyres moving poleward? So right now, if you run an ocean model and you force it with the reanalysis winds, we're pretty sure that they're underestimating. Now the ocean, the ocean currents have increased, all of them except a small one off Newfoundland of the gyre currents have increased over the last 15 years. Why do I say 15 years? Because that's how long we've had Argo floats out. This undersampling of the ocean up until 2004 is critical to understand. We don't know shit about the ocean prior to 2004. We assumed there was a conveyor belt. No, there isn't. We assumed that, there, that, the, that the Southern Ocean wasn't where all the upwelling happened. Totally wrong. We assumed that there was anthropogenic heat uptake in all the other gyres. When it turns out, it's almost entirely through the Southern Ocean that you have access to the deep ocean. I mean, that Remick paper in 2015 based on Argo showing that most of the heat uptake by the ocean, which is most of where the planetary global warming budget is going, went in around Antarctica. And when I say most, I mean 68 to 98%. So the implications for the gyres, one, we know the currents are already speeding up beyond what one would expect from the current crap winds that we're dealing with. I mean it. I feel that we have a huge climate signal here that I can't prove is there because we don't have the measurement systems, but everything, the wave speed, the wave height, the current speeds, the biogeochemical gas exchange, every other ancillary piece of information says, it's the winds. <laughs> but when I talk to my colleagues, they are extraordinarily skeptical about this. And that's fine. But I'm, you know, it's like the little red hand. Fine, I'll build an array. Fine, I'll build a climate model. Fine, I'll run a CMIP project. Okay, fine. We'll go get a satellite and measure it for real. <laughs> we actually have an airplane uh, aircraft campaign included so that we can actually borrow one of the P3s from the hurricane hunters and go down and look at it. I know, <laughs> just to be sure. We have uh, one, it's, it's five, but we'll do one last question. Alexander, go ahead. All right, um, so kind of uh, adding to the question you answered um, one before, uh, would the increased um, sea ice over the Southern Ocean, um, how would that affect the, the carbon fluxes? Because most of it's coming out in the winter and if the sea ice is expanding in the winter, um, would, would that- So sea ice, sea ice is expanding modestly, tiny amounts right around the edges. It can't expand much further because what it hits is the energy circumpolar current, which basically either rips it apart or pulls enough warm water up to uh, shred it. So it really can't go any further out. Uh, and it's not thick. Remember, this is not thick ice. It's not like the Arctic where we've got multi-year ice. There's zero multi-year ice outside of the Waddell and the Ross Sea. So it's slushy. It's mushy. It moves a lot. There are Polinia's leads and it's not monolithic like a lid. I worry more about the freshwater impacts than I do about the sea ice impacts. We, but again, we have not flown a plane down there to check what the fluxes are. Um, under the ice, we do see fluxes still continuing. They can be capped temporarily, but they don't appear to be monolithic. We do have data under the ice from SOCOM. Our floats are ice avoiding. Hey, dummy, look at your temperature sense. If it starts changing really fast, go back down. Two lines of code, it's kind of crazy. <laughs> 
Okay, Let, we'll stop right there. But there's uh, an, an entire hour of discussion if you want to stay back after a short little break for the next class, which uh, uh, Paul Cap and Marcus are going to conduct. And before you go, just uh, uh, to reiterate, we have the screening of Picture a Scientist. If you register today, you can see it over the next two days, uh, over the weekend. And uh, there is a discussion about the uh, movie on uh, Monday. So please try to uh, follow that if you're interested. And uh, thank you very much, Joellen.